Good evening, all. Thank you all very much for coming. It is a joy to see such a distinguished crowd and for a wonderful evening and a timely conversation that the college has been engaged in really for quite some time, but especially this year in the still speaking conversations that the college has been engaged in. That started in October when we had the first Niebuhr Forum with a distinguished panel on the nature of evil and then has led to a host of activities of which tonight is the next one. As we begin, I am asking you all to join with me though first in a moment of silence as we know what has occurred in Japan and continues to unfold in that region of the world and our own role of both lifting up and helping care but also to support and to think critically about all the issues that this represents. So beloved, in all the ways that you understand the holy, let us join our hearts and our minds together in a moment of silence for that land. May we be strong and may we offer hope and strength to a land that needs hope and more grace and love. Tonight's program came through the hopes that we as a college would invite the greater community to enter into a year-long conversation on the questions mightily about faith, social justice, interfaith, and in this particular case, an understanding of the nature of evil. We are not naive that these conversations are not held in a vacuum in this society. They are indeed absolutely critical given what is going on in the nation and around the world. And to address that from a profoundly theological and political place is critical. Some of you might note that tonight this is being live wired around the nation thanks to our staff here. I'm so thankful for so many of you that have come from around the local churches. I'm especially thankful that we have the men of Notre Dame from Niles here in our honor program. It's good to have you all here, gentlemen. Thank you all for coming out. We have a number of distinguished guests of which I won't go into at length, save one. Tomorrow, we will have the pleasure at this college of hosting Reverend Dr. Bernice Powell Jackson, who is the president of North America for the World Council of Churches and a UCC minister. Dr. Powell is over here. Would you all stand, please? Thank you. She will also be on campus throughout the day and then tomorrow night here also addressing questions of interfaith and also especially the questions of the need for a student Christian movement in this nation and the place of that movement in this nation. Tonight's gathering brings together also what we had saw in the construction of this year, two moments, one in the fall and now this one. And to bring Dr. Walter Brueggemann back, class of 55, author of more than 50 books, a dear friend of the college with an honorary degree, a dear member of the student Christian movement in this country, an intellect beyond measure in the nation and the world, and to give him the pleasure of sitting with our wonderful president, Dr. S. Allen Ray, to work together in a public conversation that would initially start with the two of them engaging in a conversation on the nature of evil that would eventually lead, after about 30 minutes, to questions from our community with them, and that that would go into a conversation. It is framed, however, by a sermon that our team found that Walter gave the day after 9-11 at Columbia Seminary. A seminary that is a commanding place and he was asked to preach the day after 9-11 in New York and around the nation. And he gave a sermon that we do have copies of. They framed issues on the nature of our society, our faith and evil and are part of the foundation upon which Dr. Ray and Dr. Brueggemann will begin this evening's conversation. And then it will evolve into how their conversation takes them and how we then come back together to engage in that. 
There is a very common and useful theme that Dr. Ray has brought to the college out of his Cherokee tradition of Gaduji, all working together. This night, as we bring more people in than we anticipated, all working together to think about critical issues and to raise the questions of the common good, will you all that have come this evening join me in welcoming Dr. Ray and Dr. Brueggemann to their seats, please. <laughs> Serfs. Well, we're going to uh, get ourselves settled in here and begin. But first, I'd like to uh, thank everyone who has come out this evening and uh, to um, participate in what is a conversation, uh, first between us and then with all of you. As uh, uh, Scott mentioned, uh, Walter, you published a pastoral response to the horrific events of 9-11 the day afterwards. And it's a very, very moving reflection on evil. Uh, I was struck initially by uh, two things you said. Uh, first, uh, noting that uh, President Bush had said on that occasion, our nation has seen evil. And then you said, uh, you assumed what Bush meant was to refer to the evil persons who committed these acts. And that moved you to give some thought to um, what it is that we're trying to say when we speak of these things. You said that we are drawn back to first principles by the power of negation. And later, you said that evil draws us beyond bad deeds to cosmic questions. This uh, caused me to do some thinking about what's going on when we turn to speaking of evil. And I noted how individual experiences that we have of evil deeds quickly move into statements about the substantive noun called evil, and seemingly in direct proportion to their heinousness. The more heinous something is, the less we feel that calling it a bad deed is adequate to what it is we're trying to speak of. Yet, the problem with trying to speak of evil is that it has no being. Traditionally, we think of evil, right, as the absence of good. We pursue evil under some aspect of good. So, for example, we uh, may take drugs because drugs make us feel pleasure, which in itself is a good thing. But the drugs may damage our health, causing the absence of health, a negation. And we don't pursue the absence of health, the evil, but we pursue drugs for the pleasure they give us. So all of that is to um, try to prepare the question that, that I'd like to ask you, uh, which uh, actually has uh, really two dimensions to it. Uh, one is, why do we try to speak of evil at all? Why do we try to speak of evil as opposed to simply bad deeds? And secondly, what is it, that, uh, what is it about evil that uh, is best uh, described as a power of negation? Can you comment on that, please? Well, I can, I can comment, yeah. <laughs> I'm, uh, let me say, first of all, Ray, that I'm, uh, Alan, that I'm uh, delighted to be back on campus uh, after all this time and uh, to be with you and uh, some of my classmates and some of my friends. Uh, in, in my discipline of uh, Old Testament, I think there are a variety of ways of thinking about evil. One of them, uh, which you identified, is the negation of good. Uh, but there's also, there are also two other ways in which uh, the Old Testament, two at least, uh, one is that it is uh, that evil is a function of God. So there are texts in which God says, "I do evil and I do good," so that God is portrayed in such texts as an agent of evil. The other way uh, to which I am somewhat drawn is that the Old Testament posits a kind of a dualism. It does not speculate on how that dualism came about. It doesn't go into whether it's a fallen angel or something like that. But the gain of talking about uh, dualism is that evil then is not only a negation of good, but it is an aggressive force that wants to negate the good. And uh, 
I think that the Old Testament is unsettled about these views, and I am unsettled about it, but it does seem to me that uh, given what we got in front of us, uh, that we could at least entertain the thought uh, that evil is also an aggressive agent that wants to negate the good. Uh, so I suppose uh, to talk about it, we would have to decide which of those options we think is most credible and, uh, and germane to the place where we find ourselves. Uh, that way of talking about evil uh, would understand it as a spiritual force that has been unloosed into the world. And uh, I incline to think that more, more impotent people talk that way so that you will hear more talk about Satan or about the devil in a storefront church in a day than you will hear in an Episcopal church in a year. That's what I think. So. Thank you. Well, that, that actually raises another question that I had from this. Is, um, it's very interesting. If, if, if we'll stick for a second with this idea that, that evil is the absence of good, uh, why do we sign evil an identity? even a personality, Satan, or multiple personalities like demons. And it, it strikes me that we've done this ever since our earliest myths of creation, what, what I'll, I'll take the uh, liberty of calling the pre-modern period. Yeah. And yet, for all the talk of modern period as being the, the triumph over superstition that Kant you referred to earlier this evening, as, nonetheless, here we are today, and uh, there, there is no one in this room that does not have the capacity at this instant to summon up very vivid images of Satan and demons, yep. if I ask you to do that. Your pre-modern mind is working just fine, thank you. Yep. Right? So uh, I, my question is, what is it that leads us to do this? Uh, is it a vestige of a, a pre-scientific era? Or is it some deeper component of ourselves? Well, I, th I, I think you're right. I think it, that, that language is mythic or it's poetic. But I think it is an awareness that the, the visceral sense we have of evil cannot be characterized in the categories of enlightenment rationality. And so I think that we fall back into pre-rational or pre-scientific or pre-enlightenment categories because it's the only way we know to talk about this force uh, that cannot be reduced to a, a logical principle or an empirical description that I think it's, uh, it's viscerally much underneath that. And uh, I think the language of the personal uh, is the only language we know. I suspect the same thing is true um, with, with our, our personal language of God, that we can't catch what we want to say about God in enlightenment rationality either, and so we revert uh, to poetic, uh, pre-scientific language that drives people like Richard Dawkins crazy. But, but we, are, we are speaking in poetic language when we do that. Yes, I, 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 would, I agree with you, and I think that the, um, another way to tackle this a very similar way actually is to um, uh, take the observation uh, that Re Reinhold Niebuhr offered us about uh, the mystery of evil and some of his reflections on evil, <clears throat> excuse me, that really it is a mystery. Uh, and he says at one point, I think, in The Nature and Destiny of Man, it's, an, it's a mystery almost equal to the mystery uh, of our redemption and of, of, our, of our being as people. It's very close to it. And in reflecting on this, uh, this existence of evil in the modern period, I notice that I think we're dissatisfied that evil is a mystery to be endured. Uh, rather than a problem to be solved. I think we are nowadays all about finding ways in which we can reduce the mysteries of the world to problems and then tackle them with our, our various toolkit, right? Our toolkit of solving problems. Uh, and it occurred to me that they, these toolkit uh, tools are, are rather broad. Uh, once you reduce evil to a problem, you can take up the tools of exorcism. You can take up, uh, if you have a, a church tradition that uses that, uh, you could take up tools of uh, countries for countries that are mired in poverty, for example, uh, the evils of poverty, uh, and seek to eradicate it. Uh, I'm not advocating a quietism here that does nothing. Please understand me. Uh, but what I'm saying is that if we think that evil is simply a vestige 
uh, or maybe the accumulation of lots of bad deeds, then we put them into the order of phenomena. And we can begin to, to know them and understand them according to our rules of understanding phenomena, and then develop techniques uh, for addressing them and trying to eliminate them. And part of our frustration, uh, it seems to me, is uh, or shock, perhaps, uh, is a better word, for the Holocaust, for example, yep. or catastrophic events like 9-11, is that we were brought up short, again, to realize that mystery, the mystery of evil, yep. rather than just the, the prevalence of bad deeds. And, and I think the, the, the theological tradition understands that evil is enormously seductive. If you go all the way back to Genesis 3 and the serpent, uh, we are seduced and deceived so that when we, when we do destructive things, it's not simply because we're stupid. We, we, don't, we don't smoke because we're stupid. We don't engage in land wars in Asia because we're stupid. We, we do those kind of things because we're seduced. And we are fooled into thinking uh, that somehow we can get by with this and make it work which finally leads us to, I think, to Paul's dilemma uh, in the book of Romans that the good I want to do, I don't do, and the evil I don't want to do, I do, and I don't understand why I'm doing it. I'm doing that because I am seduced in ways that are beyond my resistance. And uh, I, I think what we know is that our, that our modern rationality doesn't even begin to touch that kind of stuff. So I'm thinking of... Uh, C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters in which uh, the, the, the seducer is always at work leading us into the very things about which we know better, but we go there anyway. And uh, it seems to me that the, that the religious crisis, which gets acted out in 12-step programs, is when we finally arrive at the awareness that I do not on my own have the capacity to resist this. And then you get this appeal to uh, the saving power of God or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. let, let me um, uh, pose a, a question to you that uh, relates to, to that insight, I think. Uh, that is, um, while we can, I think, uh, articulate and defend a concept of evil that is consonant with the principles that you've just been describing. Uh, I think one of the, um, the questions that I know um, I have and others do that I've spoken to is what do we gain by calling someone or something evil? Right? What do we add to uh, an experience with that qualifier? How do we add to working that problem or engaging in dialogue as applied to people? And when we apply evil to people, as, as Bush uh, did on occasion, um, applied to people, doesn't it just demonize them literally and make them the other? Yeah. So that's sort of the counterpoint is that if we can defend using the word evil because we can understand a notion of the human being in which evil uh, has a mysterious existence, and a seductive and attractive experience, and make it kind of an, an ontological category for us, if you will, if you'll go that far as I think Niebuhr would, it's yeah. essential to us. Yeah. Uh, how do we then deploy that concept in the world, or do we? Uh, or do we in calling people evil, or situations evil, instead of just bad, bad deed doers, right? Yeah. Uh, what do we add to that, and how, why aren't we just... Um, risking demonizing them and alienating them. Yeah, I, I, do, I do not think it's helpful uh, to uh, label persons as evil. Uh, and I think when, uh, when President Bush did that, it was sort of to congratulate us. Uh, the implication is we're so good. And I, and I think uh, George Bush sort of got us into the war uh, with a Manichaean kind of principle of absolute bad and absolute good. And of course, that's a, that's a major theme of Niebuhr. Mm -hmm. The, the, uh, the right. irony of American right. history, he said, is that we're always busy congratulating ourselves on how good America is and how good we are. And, and now Barack Obama has to say that too, and on and on and on. So I, I, think, that's, I think that's really unhelpful uh, that, that it is helpful, I think, to recognize the seductive ontological force of evil, but then to assign it 
to individual persons, it seems to me, is uh, irresponsible and destructive. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I, I mean, if one wanted to, to further the parallel with goodness, for example, uh, we affirm an ontological uh, dimension to our lives that's uncategorically good. Uh, and yet we don't uh, hesitate to name individuals and things good. Yeah. It's, it's just not, we don't say they're just efficient or effective or they've done something positive for humanity. We say they're good. We don't hesitate to do that. I mean, there, there are traditions in which we can curse and we can bless, yeah. right? Uh, we take your point, there's not much to be gained by cursing people and demonizing them. And yet we, we believe there's something to be gained by saying that they're blessed or that they are good. Well, I don't, I don't find that very helpful either. Okay, uh, so you don't. You know, that Go reminds ahead. me of a statement by, by, Mark, consistent. by Mark Twain uh, in which he said, uh, he is a good person, and I mean that in the worst sense. So I'm <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me you can, you can say, um, you know, that's a good paper or that's a good deed, but to label someone as ontologically good, uh, it seems to me to deny the the deep ambiguity of mm -hmm. human personality. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, don't, I don't find that kind of labeling uh, a very helpful thing to do. Uh -huh. that, that, that would be an interesting thing. I think I'd be interested in what our group here thinks about that yeah. because it is so much a part of our, our conversation, isn't it? That if someone does a good deed and you do two of good deeds and you do three good deeds, then you're a good person. Yeah. You know, at Aristotelian, that's a character. You're seeing a character for something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we predicate that of, or we assume that for all their deeds until they show us otherwise. Right. And probably the same with bad deeds conducing to a designation yeah. of someone as evil. But you see, I'm a Calvinist, so I would not quickly assume yeah. that about anyone. Right. Well, I, I'm a Catholic, so. <laughs> there you go. I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> Well, uh, let, let me let me. Speaking of God, <laughs> speaking of God, we, we won't we won't refight the Reformation here. <laughs> well, we've agreed now. It's all a semantic misunderstanding, anyway. So That's I, right. So, <laughs> but you know what? It's good of you to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> I take it you mean good in a good sense. <laughs> <laughs> the best possible way. <laughs> all right. Let's let's. Uh, Let's, let's turn a bit to God here, if we may. Uh, because good and evil, uh, good, good crept out. This is not a conversation on goodness, and yet here we are, right? How can you talk about evil without talking about good? How can you talk about evil with, and, without talking about God? And God already crept out of the box there a little bit. Uh, the classical notion of God, as, as I, I think all of us know, if pressed, the classical notion is that God has uh, the attributes of being all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good. This gets us into the problem of evil as a problem. It's a problem to square with the classical notion of a God who, if he's all-powerful, and we'll use the he knowingly here, all-powerful, why does he permit suffering? If he's good, why does he permit suffering? If he's all-knowing, and he knows this is going to happen. How can this happen? Uh, along with this, uh, if I can throw in something else on the, on the heap here, traditionally we distinguish between natural evil and moral evil. Natural evil is the tsunami. Natural evil is the tsunami. Moral evil would be an example of uh, my choices that are bad, that harm somebody else. And Sometimes God gets blamed for the moral evil and not the natural evil, or the natural evil and not the moral evil, and sometimes both. But how do we square the, our understanding of evil, either through the, 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 the forms that you described from the Hebrew scriptures, or uh, an Aristotelian view of God as, yeah. uh, of evil as negation? Well, I, I have spent my uh, teaching career trying to help people unlearn the classical notes of God. That, uh, and, I, and I was raised on them in the old uh, little blue catechism in which I was raised. It was all omnipresent, omniscient, omni, omni, I don't know what all. And I don't know how that ever got into catechism because none of it is biblical. Um, so I think that the defining marks of God in the Bible have to do with fidelity and that God is presented as a character 
who is capable of fidelity and who is capable of infidelity. And I, I think uh, to, to try to square that with classical categories that come out of Aristotle is an impossible task. And uh, so I'll uh, take my bets on the biblical. Now, let me just say uh, about how to square all that. It seems to me that in the Bible, the extreme statement of this is in the book of Job. And Job is busy for 31 chapters of sorting all this out. And uh, then finally, uh, in chapter 38, God answers. And what God essentially says is, I'm not going to discuss these matters with you. Uh, and I think Calvin said that God prepared hell for people who ask those kinds of questions. So, uh, uh, and, and the, the, the issue is so important because the way you put it is exactly what almost everyone in popular uh, Christianity in the United States thinks. And I think we've just got a big unlearning to do about that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to move in um, just a minute to a question about alternative views of God, because I think yeah. that's where you're pressing and yeah. where a lot of us uh, would be interested in talking about that. But first, if I may, I'd like to, to quote a little more of your sermon on this point and ask you a question about it. Uh, again, this is uh, written after 9-11, and you wrote the following. Evil persists in a powerful way in defiance of the will of the Creator. And you wrote, we live in a powerfully contested world, contested all the way down, between God's goodwill and the deathliness of evil. Our commitment in the thick contest, moreover, matters, so that when we sign on in baptism, we join the contest as partisans of the vulnerable one and join the at-risk vocation that is the God-willed future of the world, unquote. Wonderful words. It really is. That's, that's, that's good. beautiful. <laughs> Good. I didn't remember. To <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> so, so here's the question that I have after that. Uh, how is it possible for evil to persist in defiance of the will of the Creator? Well, John Levinson, who is a Jewish scholar that's influ who has influenced me greatly, says that in the Hebrew Bible, uh, it is promised that God will defeat evil. But it is perfectly clear in the world that it hasn't happened yet. So that men and women of faith live by hope and promise that God will out, but quite evidently evil is still on the loose in the world. So I find that a helpful way to think about it. Now, obviously that does not fit with those classical categories that, that you cited as though God already had everything under control. Uh, that, that seems to me to be an Im yeah. impossible case to argue. Yeah. I, I think it, it, it does, uh, it literally temporizes. Yeah. Uh, it um, leads to um, understandings of time that extend for the purpose of, of either giving the devil his due on earth for some period of time and then all will be righted, all right? Uh, I think, or it creates uh, an understanding of uh, evil as uh, somehow part of what God is doing, part of God's work yeah. in and of itself, which you alluded to earlier. And in a way, it's in a rather perverse way, those, those very rigid Aristotelian categories lend themselves to making a God that I think uh, I certainly don't find that appealing, uh, a God who would temporize and uh, delay if he was all-powerful to yeah. come and write things. Well, and permit the suffering of innocents and, and the death of children and tsunamis and so on. I, I think for many people, including myself, that God is a very hard individual to, to understand yeah. as a, uh, from human terms, and maybe the answer to that is, well, that's exactly the point. God, my ways are not your ways. On the other hand, I think if one submits oneself to certain understandings of categories like knowing, powerful, and good, uh, certain things follow and certain things don't. Yep. And it's, it's very difficult to square uh, that kind of an understanding of God with our experiences today. So that leads to a, a, a couple, I'm, I'm sure, among many principles that I spotted. You, you identified them from your opening comments. One, uh, kind of a Zoroastrianism, a kind of good and evil. There are two principles in the world, one good 
and one evil. And as you say, you know, it's a contested world, contested all the way down, which is a great image, uh, suggesting that the, the game is not fixed, it's still very much in play. And where good and evil will out, we can't know. And that would compromise the power of God, it seems to me. Well, That's it seems to me that, that when you deal with, with this question of evil, you either have to side with God's power against God's goodness, or you have to side with God's goodness against God's power, because we don't know any way to say both those things. And uh, I'm clear for myself that I will not give up on God's goodness, though I'm, when I read the paper, I have great wonderments about God's power. Uh, other people solve it the other way, or the third way to solve it uh, is with Christian science that just says, well, there isn't any really evil in the world. Yeah. But then I don't think any of us think that, or we wouldn't be right. here. So, the, yeah. The, the, you're thrust back then on just a lot of bad deeds. That's right. right. That's right. Yep. The, there's there's a, been a strand in uh, theology for a good 40 years now, at least, if not more, process theology, which is one academic form in which these questions get asked and answered. Yep. And process theology in general, is uh, it gives way on some of those Aristotelian categories we've been talking about and uh, understands that God's power is exercised by persuasion, not force. So if you can't persuade someone to do something, you, you can't really be blamed if they go ahead and do it. Uh, as, as a parent of a child, I know that well. Uh, God, the better parent, perhaps is a persuasive parent, yep. and if we don't uh, yep. take that advice, then you know, this, is, this is not God's fault, as it were. Yep. Well, I, I think process theology is interesting, but I don't I don't find it compelling, and the reason I don't find it compelling is precisely because God in process theology is not an agent, and it seems to me uh, that's, that's much more comfortable to enlightenment thinking, uh, but obviously from a biblical perspective, you cannot do without the agency of God, which is an intellectual embarrassment. So we just have say, to make some say, decisions. Say a little more about why that's an intellectual embarrassment. Well, because if I talk that way to a bunch of progressives, they say, oh, but you're not talking about an interventionist God, are you? Uh, but of course, <laughs> an interventionist God is the God to whom we pray. We, we, we continually recite imperatives asking God to act. So uh, I, I'm not, uh, it violates my, what I'm capable of in terms of enlightenment reason but in terms of my understanding of faith, I'm prepared to uh, make that epistemological trade-off and imagine that God is an agent. Um, so I, I just find process theology uh, pretty anemic, uh, and it gets to be, uh, as you said, an academic exercise. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, as we you know, the, 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 the yeah. character of Paul Tillich was when you're really on your deathbed, you say a prayer to the ground of being or something like that. I don't want to do that. You, you, no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to um, ask if we could a little bit about sin because that's another concept that's been popping up here uh, as well. Sin and evil. Uh, the general question here is, what is sin and how is it related to evil? Uh, let me offer one understanding. Uh, again, this comes from Reinhold Niebuhr. But it, sin is inordinate self-love. Niebuhr says that several times. Sin is an inordinate self-love. And taken to the extreme in ourselves, it leads to narcissism and the behaviors that are associated with that. Uh, till, uh, till, uh, Niebuhr was especially concerned about groups. When groups engage in uh, excessive self-love, they uh, become idolatrous in pursuit of their own understanding of the world. His experience primarily was of the Nazis, but the examples could be multiplied that groups tend to further their own understanding of the world to an idolatrous extent and identify uh, their words with truth and uh, the other as an opponent. So that's an understanding of sin that comes to us from, from Niebuhr. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what's your understanding of sin, and how is it related to evil? Well, I, I, I think uh, 
uh, sin can be understood as being out of sync with God. But sin can also be, we're, we're back to the same thing, sin can also be understood as a propelling force and an occupying force. It seems to me in, uh, in Paul's letter to the Romans, in Romans 7, uh, he, he really understands sin as an ontological force. And in uh, Genesis 3, uh, the, the, the text says, sin is crouching at your door ready to spring at you. Um, the, the reason I want to say out of sync with God is you would know Niebuhr has been criticized uh, for uh, the understanding sin in a male way as uh, overvaluing of oneself because a number of feminists have said that the, that the, that the female sin is undervaluing of self. Uh, so it, it can work in a variety of ways. And that's why I would rather just say it's being out of sync with what God intends for us as free, responsible, historical agents, I think. And, and how we get that out of syncness is an interesting question. I, I think biblically here of temptation. Yep. If the fundamental getting out of sync is in the Garden of Eden and the story there, getting out of sync. I've, I've had this abiding question. It's a real simple one. Think back to the, the, the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. The question is, what is that cunning snake doing there? Why is there a cunning snake in that yep. story at all? And, and I'll make one final point, and it's a real question for you. But Niebuhr, again, said that, that sin is one of the, evil is one of the few things that assumes itself. For Adam and Eve to sin, there had to be a tempter to get out of sync. Something had to draw that thing out of them. And yet, what made that snake a further evil? And there's an infinite regress here. Right. Does it lead back into God, God's self, as you were suggesting? Maybe yeah. a fundamental yeah. uh, condition. Uh, how far does that go? So the question, what is that snake doing in the story? And how far back does evil have to go to explain the phenomenon of temptation? Well, as I said so eloquently in what you read, all the way down. Yes, you did. All funny. the way down. I can read it again if you'd like. <laughs> I, I, th I think that the Old Testament in, in that narrative really has no philosophic curiosity. They don't, they don't ask that question. They just know that the serpent comes with the territory, and wherever you are, you will find yourself in a garden with a serpent. You will find yourself in a place of delight and seduction. And to miss out on either one of it does not understand the human predicament. I, I think that's how the text goes. I, uh, I'm cognizant of the time, and I do want to leave time for questions from our, our great audience here. Um, let, me, let me try to, to round up a little bit of what we've been talking yeah. about here. Uh, I've heard, what I've heard in our conversation, uh, there are several understandings of evil that we've thrown out here. One is the idea of evil as the absence of good, a negation. It has no real being of its own. The second is the idea of evil as possibly being uh, an aspect of God, as interesting as that is, right? The other uh, is the notion of evil as having an independent force. You were citing St. Paul earlier. Uh, at, it's personified in Satan, in demons, uh, in invisible forces. An interesting question uh, for all of us in the modern world. Do you believe in invisible beings? And if so, what do you do about that? Is there anything you can do? So I've heard at least three different notions of evil. Uh, we had uh, some talk about uh, evil as being uh, essential to our human experience. Uh, the experience uh, on any of those dimensions might be described in uh, terms from our own experience. Uh, and also the idea that the idea of God has a hard time, traditionally, classically, uh, making sense of these notions of evil. And uh, it's possible that what we really need to be thinking about is reworking the notions of God, the notion of God, uh, alongside our experience of evil itself, which we characterize as a mystery, perhaps, and not a set of problems to be solved, but a mystery. 
and, and therefore something that is, uh, is, is wholly ascension, uh, essential to us in a cosmic dimension. Uh, and then finally, the idea that sin. Sin is this, this, uh, this separation from God, or it's undue self-love. Uh, and I raised finally the question of how do we understand the fact of temptation that creates this fundamental dislocation, uh, this faultedness in our experience? Uh, and do we have to pursue that idea of temptation and evil all the way back? And what does that mean? Where does it come to rest? In a, in a theological view, where does it come to rest? In God's self? Uh, or a primordial coexistence of evil and God? Uh, how do we understand that? And I think the, the, the act of imagination here is key. I would close my, my side with this. The act of imagination is key both to, to understanding the way in which our experiences are framed and our thoughts are formed, and to create new frames for our experiences and new frames from our thoughts. Uh, I think that uh, it's, it's not unusual for many of us that come from uh, at least a Christian tradition uh, that theological imagination is not encouraged. That is unnecessary. We can say most benignly it's not encouraged uh, to be creative in theological thinking. Uh, but I am stimulated by the conversation and by the ideas that we've had, and I hope our audience has too, so that you can engage in some theological imagination on your parts as well. And uh, with that, let me give you the last word. I think it was uh, Paul Tillich who said of all of our theological doctrines, sin is the only one for which we have empirical data. <laughs> and uh, that continues to be so, doesn't it? Yeah. It certainly does. Thank you. But thank you very much. Will you join me in the first congratulating and thanking our distinguished pair? As we come now to this time, I invite you to stand and give your name and frame your question, please. Jean, Jean Fergal, and I was interested in your uh, rejection of the uh, Greek philosopher's definition of God as omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. And what I want to ask then is, from that, I gathered that you felt that God is not all-powerful. There's some limits on his power. And I just wonder if you could say more if that's verified in both the Old and the New Testament. Well, it says of uh, Jesus in, uh, I think it's Luke 4, um, he came to Nazareth. I'm not sure it's in Luke 4, somewhere in the synoptics. He came to Nazareth and he could do no mighty work there because of their disbelief. Uh, and I think there's ample evidence um, in both testaments uh, that, that God, in some texts, has to deal with the world the way it is and cannot wish it away. Uh, I, I think that the power of God was assumed everywhere in the Near East. But that's not the biblical question. The biblical question is, is God faithful? And they struggle a lot with the faithfulness of God. So I think that's a, I think that's a more interesting question than the power of God. Um, I think you can point to texts that claim God's power, and you can point to texts that doubt God's power, uh, but I don't think uh, Israel is preoccupied with that question. I think it's the question of fidelity. So you get, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Which is an accusation to God about God's infidelity. And I just think that's everywhere. Next question, please. Professor. Good evening. Um, I'm Janice Tuck Lively in the English department here at Elmhurst College. Um, I had a question you were talking about, and it follows up to what you were just saying, this idea of uh, making a choice between the goodness of God versus the power of God as a way of, um, I guess, bringing some understanding to um, what, um, when we don't understand why bad things happen 
to good people. I know I've heard it in um, uh, the Christian circle that I'm a part of that when can I, I cannot understand or trace the hand of God, I must trust the heart of God, which I think gets back to his uh, goodness. Um, but you raise as an example for that the book of Job. And when Job is crying out, trying to understand um, why it seems as though the hand of God had churned against him or God had abandoned him, and then God responds to him and almost dares him to say, where were you? you know, uh, How does the, then the sovereignty of God fit into this paradigm that you've set up, the goodness of God versus the power of God as a way of understanding, and also the free will of man, because I think that plays into this idea when Jesus could do no good work um, there because that element of faith that is needed on our part in order for God to be able to function yeah. and do what he does. So I'd just like to hear your thoughts on those, that so idea of sovereignty and also um, the free will of man. Yeah. Well, I, I think that the, the, the whirlwind speeches at the end of the book of Job are deliberately enigmatic. Um, what I know is that, that God is a terrible pastoral counselor <laughs> because, because Job comes with all of these aches and pains and doubts and angers. And, you know, God is supposed to say, how are things going? And God says, let me tell you about the hippopotamus I just made. Uh, so I, I, I think it probably is a, is a tilt toward God's sovereignty, but it isn't quite spelled out that way. It just says, I'm not going to discuss this with you. I'm, I am not interested in your aches and pains, so quit talking to me about that. Uh, so I think uh, God is portrayed there as uh, fairly abrasive and uh, is, is not... Uh, is not terribly amenable. Uh, I don't know about free will. Uh, I tell you a joke from Columbia Seminary where I taught, which is very Calvinist. Uh, a long time ago, Dr. Gear was lecturing on double predestination. This is Calvin voodoo. <laughs> and and he, he saw a student sleeping in class. So he went up to him and he said, define double predestination. And the student said, oh, Dr. Gear, I'd I did know, but I've forgotten. And Dr. Gear said, Holy Jesus, the only person in Western Christendom who'd understood, and he has forgotten. <laughs> I, just, I just saw, uh, what's it called, Adjustment Bureau with Matt Damon, which is about free will. And uh, the movie sort of says, if you love enough, you'll have freedom against God's will. So, well, I don't find that a very uh, helpful way to talk about it. Uh, I, I think that when you talk about God's sovereignty and human free will, you have to talk about a covenant. You have to talk about a dialogical relationship in which both parties are free and both parties are bound. And it's like any serious relationship it's a matter of working that out, which never ends in complete sovereignty or in complete freedom, but it is the enigma of fidelity. And I think that's, I think that's the primary set of biblical faith. And you see, if, if we had understood that, that dialogical fidelity is the defining set I dare to think we wouldn't have gotten into all of the uh, uh, patriarchal abuse of women. We wouldn't have gotten into the silencing of gays. We wouldn't have needed to get into enslavement of blacks. Because dialogical freedom means that both parties are always at risk. And I think that in the Bible, that's true of our relationship with God in which both parties are free and both parties are bound and it has to be with working it out. Does that make sense? I, I'd, well, like to, I'm lucky. I'd like to uh, uh, add, add something to that. I think the, um, 
the, the conversation about God, God and sovereign, sovereignty and covenant with us uh, reminded me that of an absence in the conversation that, that comes in here for me, and that's the role of Christ as Christians. We have said very little about Christ. The traditional redemptive function of Christ, of the world and of individuals, as uh, a, uh, uh, a means of reconciling that primary disjunction that we talked about. Uh, and I put that next to your notion of, of God as you're, you're sketching it out here. What is the role of Christ in your thinking as a Christian? Well, I, I think that, that uh, in, in Christian confession uh, that Christ is the utter embodiment of God's self-giving and the utter embodiment of God's summoning and commanding. So that if in the Old Testament God gives self and God commands Israel to obey, then it seems to me that in Christ both of those are pushed to extremity. So that Jesus is utterly self-giving, John 3.16, but Jesus summons to radical obedience or about as radical as is imaginable. Uh, so I think it's uh, the, uh, uh, the plus intensification of what's already given in the Old Testament. And does he affect reconciliation in us, between us and God, for you? Yes, uh, and the reconciliation uh, is a dialogical thing so that Christ must be embraced, um, but the initiative is taken from the side of the eternal lover. That's what I think, yeah. So that would be, that would be a way of addressing the mystery of evil that we were talking about. Before. That's correct. But as you know, or as we know, Christ's triumph is not a show of worldly power. It's a show of extraordinary vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Yep. Let me bring back here. We've got one of our students back here. Uh, I'm Ryan. Uh, you touched on this a little bit with uh, your talk about the covenant. Can't uh, the problem of temptation and moral evil be explained away by the fact that if in order for us to truly love God and love goodness, don't we have to, ha isn't that an act of will which necessitates a choice between doing what's good and doing what's wrong? Well, I'm a Lutheran, and uh, Lutherans believe that our will is corrupted, that our will is not pure and innocent, but it is already distorted. So we cannot, we, we cannot simply will to obey God unless God intervenes to heal our will. I, I think that the, the assumption that we can just choose the good is the assumption that I am not seduced. And I believe the serpent story wants to say that at, from the beginning we are seduced. Now, let me, let me respond to you. I, I said this at dinner to a few people. When I was a sophomore at Elmhurst College, I, one day in front of uh, Arian Hall, I read Niebuhr's uh, moral man and immoral society and I was so shocked by it that I read it again because I thought it couldn't be what I think it says and this is where Niebuhr uh, kind of went public with his acute Lutheran understanding of sin uh, that we cannot in our innocence choose the good without the intervention of God. Uh, and and I, my hunch is that your question probably reflects where I was when I was a student at Elmhurst, in which I had some innocence about that if I choose the good, I ought to be able to choose the good. And, and what the theological tradition shows is that, that I don't do that. 
I don't do that even when I know to do that. And however one talks about that, whether you want to talk about original sin or the fall or being seduced, and Paul then says in Romans, I am at war with myself about this. I don't know why I act the way I act. Uh, so all of us have, all of us have moments of innocence, and we try to stage this as a summer camp for our kids and <laughs> give them a moment of pure innocence in which they may commit to the gospel and all that. But you can't stay at summer camp, you know. It's, you go back to the way it is. So that's what I think. Um, if if I could simply will to do that, um, I don't think we'd be having this conversation. It's it's the theological problem is way underneath that. About we find ourselves helpless in the face of how we live our lives. And I think that Niebuhr's accent then is we knew we need to lower our voice about being good Americans or leaders of the free world or whatever uh, because we are never that innocent. That's what I think. I think I would add also that uh, other traditions would understand the relationship uh, with God as uh, uh, different and uh, that uh, nothing can separate us from the love of God and that the will uh, after the fall, however you conceive it, is not uh, wholly corrupted and is capable of making an act of free choice for God that is in laid, uh, fulfilled in a sanctified life uh, through sacraments. That would be more the Catholic understanding, I think. Gentlemen, back here, please. Uh, I'm Jeff. You had mentioned that um, in Scripture you find that the person has to deal with evil against in the framework um, that evil challenges God's creation and that God is faithful to it. And so if you look at it as an eschatological conquering of this, um, this promise of Yahweh to the person, will that mean, um, or I guess, how do you understand the nature of this victory to take place within creation? And what does it mean for um, all of creation, you might say, in the sense that the enemy is not anyone in creation necessarily, but the force that... Um, challenges God's will, or I guess Bart would say the, that to which God says no to. So your, your question is, what's the nature of the victory? I guess, like, how will it look in the end, in the sense that if he is to actually conquer evil in the end, yeah. um, as he has promised, what does that mean for the rest of creation after evil has finally been ousted? Well, it seems to me that, that the uh, Bible uh, has to use a variety of poetic images uh, to talk about this. I suppose the ultimate one is in Revelation 21, a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem and no more chaotic waters. And that's already present in the Old Testament in Isaiah 65, a new heaven and a new earth and a Jerusalem. And then the, the poem goes on to say, no more infant, infant mortality, uh, no more foreclosure, on subprime loans, and it goes through the whole inventory. So in many poetic idioms, it is a description of shalom, of well-being, of fruitfulness, of joy, of peaceableness, all the positive words that you can think of. Uh, just uh, you get a torrent of those words because the Bible writers know that there's no one right way to picture that. Are you done? <laughs> uh, John Mojiedler, Elmhurst College, class of 59. Um, I think we're caught up in uh, not being able to overcome metaphysical thinking, uh, enlightenment rationality, and so um, I don't think I or anyone is going to be able to provide a happy ending. I don't. I think mystery is the closest we come to saying anything about this topic. And um, forgive me if I just do the quick footnote, Martin Heidegger, um, and language. Um, but 
not intending again to get the happy ending, but uh, I am very persuaded by the faithfulness of God. And I hear you talking about the infidelity of God. Yeah, I can understand all that. Um, if anything, God certainly did abandon the Jews in the Holocaust. I mean, what greater infidelity could there be from this attempt to try to say anything about all this? But uh, for me, and we know that uh, Jesus also doubted, you know, if, if it could be done any other way, why does it have to be done this way, etc. But is not somehow God's faithfulness, what word do I put in there, validated uh, by Jesus Christ, the Christ event, and what we believe to be the resurrection, even if we want to call that metaphorical language? Well, I, I believe that that Theologically and confessionally, that's true, and I share that confession. But below the confession is one's personal experience, so it's a pastoral question. Uh, Ted Turner uh, is, uh, often has said that when he was 14, his sister died. And he said, that's the day I quit believing in God. And stuff, stuff happens to people that is unbearable. And every pastor knows that when you're in front of that, the confession of the church, which I share, does not trump one's personal sense of betrayal and abandonment. So you can give that final answer in the confession, but then you discover in pastoral sensibility it doesn't stay final, it comes undone and has to be processed again. So I imagine that we are always, we believers, are always moving in and out of some kind of confessional certitude and then the pastoral reality of day-to-day -day life that very often contradicts the confession and we just live in the midst of that uh, and it is completely unconvincing when when I am in a Ted Turner moment I wish I had more Ted Turner moments, but you know, <laughs> when I am in a Ted Turner moment, it is, it is completely unconvincing for someone to try to lay the confessional certitude on top of that, because it makes a lie of it. And I, I, I just think that's how it is with us. When we pay attention to the lived reality of our daily life, I'd like to, um, to add one point to that, and I know we're drawing to a close. The, 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 the question, as it revolves around Christ, uh, makes me mindful that one response, and one that comes to me personally, is to understand the example of Christ as someone who experienced all three kinds of the definition of evil that we've been talking about. That Christ experienced uh, the demons affirmatively in his ministry. He experienced the nothingness of facing death on the cross, and he cried out, why hast thou forsaken me? Raising the question of what is the intimate relationship of evil to God? And the, the ability to keep the covenant on our part is the best we can do. And maybe that's Job's answer. I don't know why, but I will keep the covenant on my part. I've experienced evil as many ways as, as people can see it, and experience it, and I have my template in the example of Christ. Several of the students asked me throughout the time as we came to this day uh, what the sermon would be like, Walter, that you would preach this September 11th, 10 years after that sermon mm -hmm. that you gave on the 12th. So as I come back to pick up another question, I would be interested in your reflections on that which you will preach this coming September, should you have the opportunity. Well, I, I'm retired now, so I don't have to... <laughs> I, I think, Not an answer. <laughs> I think that I have become uh, more fully convinced of uh, the enmeshment of the United States 
in all the kinds of uh, narcissistic pride about which um, Niebuhr warned us. And I think if I were uh, to have an opportunity to preach, uh, I would want to talk about the need for systemic U.S. repentance of our imperialism. Um, I, I really am um, deeply troubled about what's happening to our society. And it seems to me that the, the demonic power of greed is uh, hugely destructive among us. And I think that's what I would try to talk about. And I, I, I think the greed is, uh, is uh, fed by our anxiety, so it's a vicious circle of anxiety producing more anxiety. I flew here out of Cincinnati, and you know, Cincinnati is just infested with terrorists. <laughs> and and I, 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 I could not believe the deep bodily examination I had to go through at the airport and I, I just think it's absurd uh, that, that we are in the grip of such anxiety uh, that no good will come of that, I think. Thank you very much. We have a question back here, please. Dave Neely, I, I'm intrigued by this, these three omnis that seem to be so powerful in the last 2,000 years and yet not very biblical and wondering, so they must work somehow or is it, because the institutional church kind of took them on to themselves, because the Roman Empire took them on to themselves? I mean, maybe if God was omniscient, maybe they were too. I mean, what, what, what drove all this? It obviously must have worked, even though it kind of doesn't make any sense. I'll, I'll take a, a quick shot at that. Uh, I would give the answer that it is, uh, it's a function of theological imagination on the part of um, those who had access to defining uh, religious vocabulary and terms. It is a function of uh, our experience of dominion as the exercise of power optimally done wisely and with foreknowledge of uh, consequences. So it's a relatively easy step if that's your experience of, uh, of uh, sovereignty, to use uh, that term again, to uh, predicate that of God, to assign those attributes to God. And the, the fact that we no longer live in a society that's monarchical in which we regularly have experiences of kings that have unfettered dominion, power, uh, and we know now uh, our knowledge is highly contingent on cultural circumstances and uh, the, the goodness that we attribute to other people. Uh, again, it's a function of, of how they see uh, themselves and their culture very often, has weakened uh, the, the, the social support for continuing uh, a, an understanding of God that's largely derived from the feudal period, in my opinion. Alan, that seems to me to be an extraordinarily shrewd answer. If I'm hearing, I, I, I want to see if I got that right because I think it's so important. You're saying that it's theological categories projected top down from social power. Yes. Wow and wow. <laughs> One more question back here, please. Uh, Bill Barons. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and we say it every Sunday, and you get to that part where he says, he's teaching his disciples, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, or sometimes deliver us from the evil one. What did he mean? <laughs> where where it requires like interpreting what Jesus meant. I'm going to yield to Walter. I had a teacher at Eden Seminary, some of you will know his name yet, Elmer Arndt. He once said in class, Jesus said, and rightly so. <laughs> Isn't the, the New Ecumenical Translation uh, do not take us to the time of trial? That, it would seem to me, was a worry in the early church, as in the book of Acts, that they would be led uh, before Roman authorities for their faith. Now you have to puzzle about how you get from temptation to trial or trial to temptation. 
but if you take it the way we have conventionally translated it, it is as though God may be prone to seduce us. Huh? That was implied in your question, I think. And uh, I, think, I think that's probably right with that translation. Uh, I take it we've sort of decided more recently that's not the best translation. And what we've done is to take it back to a political metaphor of courtroom trial. But as everything in the Bible, it's so uh, elusive you can let it mean many things. It's called imagination. Friends, will you join me in thanking our two distinguished panelists this evening, please. I think all of us will agree that, Dr. Ray and Dr. Brueggemann, that you have given us much to think about in a great evening. There are refreshments in the back, and there are many programs coming forward that I invite you to look at the web of the college page. I do ask one thing, that as you begin to frame this, for especially those of us who are in this season of Lent, to ask where these questions will manifest themselves here at this college, for us to think about how we understand that and how we'll live that out for the students and the faculty that work here with me. Tonight is just one of the many programs. We look forward to you seeing your time back here with us and for all the good work. Thank you very much for coming.